Hello and welcome to India's World. Today we are going to discuss India-Japan ties in the context of the impending visit of Japanese Emperor Akihito and Empress Michiko to India. Emperor Akihito is no stranger to India. He first visited India in December 1960, soon after his marriage and much before he ascended the throne in 1989. Japan's imperial dignitaries rarely take a foreign visit, which makes the current visit to India especially significant. Both India and Japan have changed enormously since 1960 when Emperor Akihito as a young man was here. The presence of Japanese companies in India is widespread now. There are 926 Japanese companies operating at more than 1800 sites across India. India and Japan are also developing an increasingly robust security relationship. Both countries are preparing to sign a civilian nuclear cooperation agreement also. The questions we are asking today in this context are, will the imperial visit from Japan lend additional momentum to India-Japan ties? What are the drivers of the political and security relationship between India and Japan? And what is the nature of India-Japan economic ties and what needs to be done to strengthen them? To answer these questions, we have with us a very distinguished panel of experts. We have with us Ambassador Arjun Asrani. He was India's ambassador to Japan between 1988 and 1992 and is currently chairman of the India-Japan Partnership Forum at FIKI. We are also very lucky to have with us Research prof Professor Takenori Horimoto, he is specialist in South Asian politics and US uh, Asia policy and you are located at Kyoto University. And we have Professor Shrabani Roy Chaudhary, she teaches Japanese studies at the Center for East Asian Studies at JNU's School of International Studies. So welcome all of you to this discussion. Ambassador Asrani, let me begin with you. Mm -hmm. How significant is the Empress visit to India and in what way do you think the Imperial visit would lend any impetus to Indo-Japan ties? Well, actually, I would have been surprised if the visit had not taken place because our relations have grown so much in the last 20 years, especially, but especially in this century, that the absence of the imperial visit would have been something remarkable. Uh, I must say that uh, we have had several presidential visits from India to Japan. So even in protocol, uh, imperial visit is was called for although he is a symbolic head of state he is a head of state so in that sense this uh, visit was very much in order I am very keen not to give the impression that it has anything to do with our growth of security relations it should be seen purely in cultural terms in terms of the people of the two countries coming closer to each other emotionally because certainly the imperial family continues to be very dear to the heart of the Japanese people and that uh, symbolic uh, chief, the uh, emperor, to come to India is something which brings the two people closer together. Okay. Professor uh, Horimoto, uh, how important is this kind of symbolism for the Japanese people and to Japanese investors? Yes, um, the constitution itself, it is mentioned as symbol of Japan. And then that means a political situation's existence. But at the same time, the emperor carries very enormous popularities and enormous uh, affinity from the people. So not only from the Japanese people, but probably when they visit to India, they may give a sort of tremendous impact in terms of the culture or something. So the, the, the people of Japan start looking at India with, with different yes, eyes? Yes, that's why I'm saying to the Japanese media, you should make a special program on his visit to India. Okay. Uh, uh, Professor Roy uh, soon after the Empress visit, uh, there's a visit scheduled by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe for the annual India-Japan summit. So uh, would it be right to say that the Empress visit would create the symbolism, the atmosphere, for major breakthroughs which would then take place when the executive head, that is the Prime Minister, comes to India? Um, I think that is stretching a point too much to ex assume that executive level talks would change because of the symbolic visit. I think the visit Not change, is they'll get extra ex momentum. Def definite extra momentum in, the ca in case of especially areas which I feel is that the, for the Japanese people it also has an element of, you know, upgradation of India in the Japanese uh, political uh, um, approach towards international relations. So this upgradation means a lot more to um, the Japan than what we could, you know, common people of India would understand this. But as specialists, we also, we understand the kind of upgradation that India will have symbolically because of this visit. 
I also think uh, it also sort of sends a message across to our neighbors, uh, neighboring nations, that where India is getting positioned. And I feel the biggest momentum might happen now that the SMEs, which have been shying away you know, from uh, coming here with that element of whether it is right, wrong. SMEs are those small and medium small enterprises. Small and medium thing. Those companies will feel very heartened by this visit and probably will the message will become more strong and clear that India is there for Japan. We will come to the small and medium enterprises I in a minute. Add a point here. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, at the government level, relations could not have been better. Uh, today, the relationship is what I dreamt of in 1992. But what the imperial visit adds is the the people of it. It brings in the people of Japan into the love affair yeah. between the two countries. Okay. Even when uh, the present emperor visited as a crown prince, I was third secretary in Tokyo. I saw the result in Tokyo. My mother used to go for shopping for her groceries. And uh, after the visit, the, the, the shopkeeper uh, was offering her a discount. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> well, well uh, I should go to Japan immediately after the emperor's <laughs> visit and get all those discounts. But <laughs> Professor uh, Horimoto, what drives uh, India-Japan relationship? People say this is the uh, relationship to watch in Asia-Pacific in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So uh, is this relationship driven by positive commonalities or is it because we both share the same suspicion of China, same de economic dependence on China? Mm -hmm. So how big is the China factor in this relationship? Probably there are the two major factors. One is the strategic, the other is the economy. And both of the characters, from the viewpoint of India and Japan, just dovetailed. And then uh, I am not going to say third country or something like that. But at the moment, in the past two decades, the, uh, this relationship has grown much. And then on this occasion, emperor is coming, just like a finishing touch to, 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 you know, to brush up for the, this relation. Okay, we need to take a break at this point. We'll be back again with this discussion in a minute. Don't go away. Welcome back. We are discussing India-Japan relationship in the context of the Japanese Emperor's visit to India. Uh, Professor Roy Chaudhary, let's talk about Indo-Japan economic relationship and what is driving it. Japan's population is aging at the fastest rate in the world. It's estimated that by 2050, Japan's population will be less than 100 million. That the population of those about 65 years would be about 39%. Its labor force will shrink, which means its saving rates will go down. Therefore, investment will go down. So Japan needs direct foreign investment in Japan. It also needs to go out of Japan to, to, uh, uh, to seek uh, 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 profits, to make investment and also to seek labor. So uh, in this context, um, how significant is the relationship with India? I think for the first time we are in a situation right now in India where we could say that here so long what we've been driving at academically saying that it's one of those best place to invest, etc. I think right now the momentum has taken off. And with all the kind of culmination of whatever you just right now said, India seems to be a right place to come in. More of so because now the you see the China's uh, growth rates are now slowly decreasing. There are issues, political issues with China. So looking at a, a friend where all positives of cheap labor, better investment um, climate, I think India now would get its share. Because in spite of whatever we say today about the growth that you mentioned right now, the number of uh, thing and the deepening investment, we are still far behind, say, the ASEAN countries. Yeah, I just, may, may take that question to Professor yeah. Horimoto. Uh, you know, the largest uh, foreign direct investment by Japan is in actually United States of America. But we'll leave America aside. Let's compare China and India. Uh, of the total uh, FDI going out of Japan, India gets only 1.9%. And China gets 9% and it's increasing. Mm. Um, FDI to ASEAN, ASEAN countries is also on an upward trend. With India, it's either stagnant or coming down, which, you know, it's, it's not going up. So what, what makes India such an attractive destination under such circumstances? Because the data actually shows investment is not going up since 2010. No, in a sense, um, Japanese um, investment is very careful to, to do, you know, in a gigantic way. Yeah. And uh, at least China is concerned. There is a sort of base for the Japanese government and Japanese uh, private in uh, companies yeah. to invest, and but that go gradually, gradually. So in case of India also, 
I think um, this piece is not so rapid one, but more, more gradually, gradually it may be moving up. And at the moment, as you mentioned, there are 1,000 companies, Japanese companies in India, and whereas in China, roughly about 4,000 to 5,000. But it will go gradually to that level. Okay. Uh, Ambassador Asrani, the problems that Japanese companies face in India, uh, they say it's not merely of inadequate infrastructure and a complicated uh, tax system, but labor costs are also rising. There are other companies to compete with. Uh, the process of getting permissions from state governments are opaque. Uh, they don't know, uh, you know, where to get environmental clearances, who, who uh, has control over land, uh, who has control over water, you know. So, infrastructure is lacking, there's a complicated tax system, our laws keep getting changed, and it, it, it's become very difficult for uh, even big Japanese companies to operate in India. So, under these circumstances, what is the hope of small and medium enterprises that Professor Rai Chaudhary was talking about, of coming to India and functioning? The real picture is that Japanese investment in India was growing quite fast, except over the last year or two, yeah. uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, our own investments by our own industrialists have not grown very much. So, for the same reasons, uh, they have not been finding India a very uh, 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 sort of welcome uh, place to go. But if you look at their studies, even the latest study by Jethro, etc., it still puts India as yes. the future largest market number, next to number, Indonesia. No, number one. Number one is Indonesia, number yeah. two is India. So, from long term point of view, they have never ceased to look at India yeah. as the market. Also, keeping in mind that China and Southeast Asia have reached more or less a saturation point. Therefore, India may not be better than those, but they are the, India is the future market. But there are other problems with China. They burnt a Japanese supermarket. That is also there, you see. So, the, now, what do they, how do they manage to overcome these problems that you have very correctly pointed out? First of all, they hope that things will improve. No, they themselves and, are building the and, infrastructure first and, before coming and in. As far as the SMEs are concerned, what we have to remember is that the SMEs were the backbone of Japanese industry, manufacturing. Now, Japanese are no longer in the manufacturing exports market because of the yen, etc. Uh, the Japanese have lost their markets to uh, Korea, China, etc. So, where do these poor SMEs go? They are no longer suppliers to the large Japanese companies in Japan. So, they have to go out of Japan to become the suppliers to the larger uh, industries, and they see future prospects in India. Okay. Now, you mentioned that there are 920 odd companies. Can, can these be big companies? <laughs> big companies would be a few score, maybe 20, 30. So, all these uh, remaining beyond, say, the first 50, the remaining are all okay. SMEs. All right. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Roy Chaudhary, uh, you know, I, I don't want to sort of uh, rain on uh, the India-Japan parade, but uh, there are proportionately more uh, loss-making Japanese and Japan-affiliated companies in India than in uh, East Asia. So, the percentage of uh, such companies in India is 38.5%. <coughs> Compare this with Philippines, 13.2%, Thailand only 17%, Indonesia 13.9%, ASEAN as a whole 17.6%. So, why should India be a more attractive destination than say Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, because already uh, those Japanese companies which want to move out of uh, China or diversify the investment, after comparing India and Vietnam, are actually going to Vietnam. Uh, yes and no. Yes, because short term maybe Vietnam is fine. But India is seen by these companies as a market which is residential within the boundaries of the company as soon as they invest in India. The problem of uh, low profits from India is emerged because of the kind of issues that we've already talked about, you know, the labor price increasing and um, infrastructure issues. But there is still a um, strong uh, bearing among the Japanese company that a politically stable um, uh, economy, the political situations across Indian states believe now that invited uh, investments are important. So effectively, they 
assume that in long term as um, Astrani ji just now mentioned that even Jethro has put India in the second uh, medium to long term as it. So companies that can wait out this period of uncertainty with respect to infrastructure etc. Assume that over time this will be overcome and SMEs therefore are waiting. Okay. All right. May I say a few words? Yeah, I'll come back to you. Okay. Uh, we need to take a break at this point. Uh, we'll be back again with this interesting discussion after the break. Don't go away. Welcome back. We are discussing India-Japan relationship in the context of Japanese Emperor Akihito's visit to India. Uh, Professor, before we went on the break, you wanted to say something. Yes, yes. yes. Um, if I dare to say few words, the um, potentiality. And India is supposed to be the most high potentiality in the world with a huge population and then wide area. And not only that, India has command, you know, geographical conditions. And if, for example, Japan is just periphery of Eurasian continent, China is also. But whereas China is, I mean, India is just center, subcontinent, just center of this Eurasian uh, plate. So in that sense, in both of the way, the India carries a very uh, high potentiality from now on. Okay, so given the significance of India, India's location, um, uh, Ambassador Asrani, how significant are the security relations between India and Japan? Um, mm -hmm. And we have a great amount of exchange and dialogue, etc. But what is the significance of this security relationship? Security relationship, I would say, we should have very limited expectations. First, because of the Japanese constitution. I know that there are moves to change yeah. Article 9 of the constitution, yeah. but that's a long-term affair. Uh, basically, the people of Japan have become extremely pacifist after the sufferings in the war and the uh, Hiroshima Nagasaki atom bombs. So uh, for any prime minister of Japan, however desire, desirous he might be to bring about a change, it's not going to be easy. You have to change the constitution. Uh, but short of having any security alliance, we can certainly cooperate and without any change in the constitution. Number one, what we are already doing, having joint naval exercises, our uh, Navy coming to the rescue of any Japanese ships in trouble through piracy, etc., all those uh, policing of the uh, waterways. The other area where there is only a Japanese cabinet decision uh, coming in the way, a past cabinet decision of the 1960s and 70s, which prevents Japanese export of defense material, even technology, to any country. Even for USA, they had to make an exception uh, in the parliament. Yeah. Now that this Abe government is trying to change. Okay, let me take that sure. to <laughs> Professor Roy Chaudhary. So do you think therefore that this change will happen and uh, we will explore new ways of defense cooperation because already Japan is considering supplying the US to amphibious aircraft to India and we are talking of uh, transfer of uh, military technology. Do you see that happening? Um, Abe's government is actually well positioned with yeah. the July election and upper house uh, victory. Yeah. They're really well positioned to think of a change in the yeah. uh, parliament. Um, but uh, I think it'll be a, it'll go a little slow. Then you could, cannot expect much happening immediately by this year. But every talk between the two prime ministers hereafter would definitely have this issue. Okay. And we'll see small <coughs> windows opening up every time. Okay. Professor Horikawa. Uh, yeah. is, uh, I, mean, I mean to say that there is a, you should divide into two parts. One is economy and the other is strategic. Yes, yes. And I mean to say when you say you two or uh, you know some other sort of military uh, equipment and so on, this is kind of purely bilateral things. Of course, somehow affecting surrounding country, uh, areas, but basically this one. But at the same time, this uh, strategic relationship between India and Japan is quite different from this one. I agree with you, but I'm saying that strategic relationship really hasn't taken off. That trilateral dialogue, hmm. Japan, US, India, is not taking off. At one point, it was supposed to be extended to Australia and made a quadrilateral dialogue. Even that is not happening. So I, I'm not on that at all. I'm merely okay. now talking of bilateral defense cooperation. Okay. Uh, but the question I wanted to ask you was, what is the future of uh, civilian nuclear cooperation between India and Japan? In Japan, 
after the massive uh, uh, water leakage, uh, radioactive water leakage at Fukushima, mm. the massive protests all over the country, mm. and Japan itself shutting down uh, 50 of its uh, power producing, mm. electricity producing reactors. What sense does it make for Japan to transfer that technology, which it is not using itself, to India, or for India to import that technology? May I say that uh, it should be finalized by India itself, not by whether India is, Japan is going to export or not, and wh whether India is going to accept it or not. This is number, point number one. And number two is the, um, about the sort of strategic relationship. The um, section of the lead, Japanese leaders want to have an alliance with India. I'm saying no. It is impossible for India to have an alliance with other countries. And probably at the moment, India's foreign policy is just like a second, no alliance point 2.0. So under these uh, situations, there's no alliance could be possible. But I'm always saying to the Japanese people, as far as um, alliance is concerned, or strategic relation is concerned, we should keep good terms, that's all. Okay. But on nuclear issue, we've never seen eye to eye with, uh, with Japan. Uh, you know, our, our perceptions about uh, uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear energy today are diametrically opposite. India takes pride in being a nuclear power, having done Pokhran to, uh, uh, and wants to generate enormous amount of electricity in Japan. Japan is running away from both. Japan, in fact, wants India to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, the Fissile Material Cut-Off Treaty. So if you have these kind of differing perspectives, how do you uh, have a, a civilian nuclear cooperation agreement? Oh, as Professor Horimoto said, on this question, it has to be looked at it purely from the commercial economic angle. From the Japanese point of view, commercial economic angle. They need he was saying only India has to decide. I think Japanese also have to decide and they're probably they, no, acting no, under pressure yeah, from no, no, uh, there, commercial yes. enterprises. No, no, there is a stumbling block within Japan yeah. to overcome their opposition. But that may be possible yeah. if it is restricted only to selling uh, nuclear power equipment. Yeah. Because Japan economically needs to export something. And uh, willy-nilly, the Japanese will have to consider. As, as Professor Horimoto said, we have to decide where we want. And we are open. If we at all are going forward in our uh, nuclear energy policy, then Japan is definitely the most important source because even American sources are connected with Japanese technology. Even French are. So for us, it is important, more important than even for the Japanese exporters. Uh, I see good prospects of this materializing uh, in the uh, not too distant future, unless there is opposition in both countries yeah. to nuclear power itself. Okay. That is a different question. Well, Raj, um, I mean, these deals may happen, but psychologically, uh, socially, how difficult will it be for J uh, Japan to accept India's uh, nuclear ambitions and India's nuclear program, because after all, nuclear tragedies are deeply etched into Japanese psyche. So some businessmen might want to export uh, nuclear technology to India, but the people themselves may not support it. Yeah, definitely. The psychological barrier, especially after the Fukushima incident, you know, when I felt when Japan was slowly easing out of the Hiroshima's uh, thing, the Fukushima incident only brought back to them and in a different way, the whole tragedy. And people definitely you across Japan continue to protest on these kind of issues. But then, uh, you know, often business continues in spite of people's protest. We've seen that across the world. So I often feel that maybe, you know, and uh, if it is well uh, placed before the people, then the nuances of the fear of nuclear can be erased out and the technology will travel. All right, we've run countries. out of time. I'd like to thank all of you for coming here and analyzing India-Japan relations uh, in view of uh, the Emperor's visit. So thank you very much and I hope this relationship really takes off and I hope we'll have you again in India and have you again in our studios, Professor Horimoto, Professor Raj Chaudhary, Ambassador Asrani. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all we have for you today. Uh, we'll be back again next week with another interesting issue. Till then, goodbye.